um, who uh, Daphne did her PhD in education at Cambridge University. Um, her research is on the LC, or the ethical, legal, and social implications of genetics research. She's currently a postdoc at the Center for uh, the Center Stanford Center for Biomedical Ethics, um, and she co-leads along with Michelle Meyer, who's who's uh, now here as well on the back. Um, the Hastings uh, Hastings Center Working Group um, on um, Social Behavioral Genomics and the LC issues. Um, and so we're um, very lucky to have Daphne here uh, to tell us about some of her work. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, it's yeah, it's great to be here. Um, so as you might have gotten the sense from Dan, my PhD is in education, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about. LC, ethical, legal, social implications questions within the context of education. Um, but before I get to that, I first want to start with why have I been asked to give this lecture? Why should we consider the social and ethical implications of social science genomics? What do people think? OK, ugly history, other reasons. Are there any system? Yes, go ahead. A person's genes are pretty darn sensitive information that we don't want to just really distribute. Good, yes. Other thoughts? Are there any system level structures that encourage you to think of the social and ethical implications of your work? IRB. Maybe not just, who said it? IRB. IRB, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So there, there are a number of reasons, um, including all the ones you guys have mentioned. One might be responsible conduct of research. I don't know if anyone here has taken a responsible conduct of research course. I know at Stanford that it's required for people who are NIH, NSF funded, and the center I'm a part of facilitates that training. Uh, IRB, as, as Tammy pointed out, granting bodies. You might also have grant bodies that encourage you to think through the ethical or social implications of the work that you're doing, social pressures, uh, uncertainty over current and future applications. Um, I want to talk about my reason, which is this historical conflation of race and ability. So uh, as part of my doctoral work, I was working in schools in the Chicago area. And as a thank you to teachers for meeting and working with me, I decided to volunteer in some of their classrooms. And one day, uh, I was in a fifth grade classroom, and the students had completed a reading on Katherine Johnson, who people might recognize that name from Hidden Figures. And the students were asked to create a little mind map summarizing some of the key points they got from that reading. Um, this was a, a public charter school. Over 90% of students were low income. Over 90% of students were African American. And one of the girls on her chart um, put down, just because you're black, you can be smart. So that was the message that she had taken away from learning about Katherine Johnson. And this is one of the guiding motivations of the work that I do, this historical conflation of race and ability and the social and ethical implications that come along with it. I feel it's always important for researchers to state their positionality, what got them into the work that they do. So this is one example of, of what's motivated me. Um, but as you pointed out, genetics has an ugly history. It, it's been used to discourage the abolition of slavery, to resist desegregation efforts, um, to restrict immigration as well, uh, and to justify laws that outlaw interracial marriage. Myself being a product of an interracial uh, marriage, thinking about the fact that it, it wasn't until the 1960s that that was legal in the United States, um, still sits heavy with me. Another big aspect of this ugly history is involuntary sterilization. So this is Carrie Buck here on the left and her mom, Emma Buck. Carrie was born in 1906 in my home state of Virginia, Charlottesville, Virginia, to be specific. Um, and at the age of 17, she was uh, placed in an institute for epileptics and the feeble-minded. Um, one of the common practices within that institute was to sterilize people who they felt were feeble-minded, um, you know, who might uh, in some way degrade the, the genetic pool. Um, Carrie, of course, did not want to be involuntarily sterilized, 
And uh, the result was the 1927 Supreme Court case, Buck v. Bell. Uh, in an eight to one decision, they deemed forced sterilization for eugenic purposes legal in the United States. And the doctor who wanted to, um, to perform this sterilization, um, you know, this, this was something that allowed the rest of the United States to, to follow suit if they so wished. And so by 1935, all but six states had attempted to introduce legislation permitting uh, involuntary sterilization. So all of this is to say that one of the big things that we have to tackle as a field is uh, understanding and ameliorating injustice in genomics and to be vigilant about progressing the science, moving genetic science forward without breathing new life into mythologies about inherent racial differences. Key piece of this is social responsibility of researchers. And so I want to frame uh, the, the rest of my talk around this idea of social responsibility and particular dilemmas uh, that people might encounter as they think about their social responsibility. So um, one dilemma might be dilemmas related to problem selection, and I'm going to go into more about what I mean by that shortly. Uh, another dilemma could be related to publication and data sharing. And a third could be d dilemmas related to engaging society. And I've taken these three dilemmas from a paper published by Resnick and Elliott, a bioethicist and a philosopher um, around uh, social responsibility. So let's look at this first one, dilemmas related to problem selection. Um, if you've seen me give a talk, you've probably seen this slide before. I love this slide. I think this slide is, does a great job of showing just how polarized the field of genetic genomics can be, social and behavioral genomics being uh, one subset that is particularly polarized. Um, you will see people uh, like Paige, who, who is here on Monday, writing op-eds saying progressives should embrace the genetics of education. And you see others who say that sociogenomics is opening a new door to eugenics. So um, this is a, a place where there is a lot of contentious debate, a lot of discomfort among people about whether this research should or should not be done. And that is uh, an example of the dilemma of problem selection. Um, to look at this in a little bit more detail, uh, let's take a look at this example. This is, the next two slides are adapted from Sam Trejo, who was a student here, I think in 2019, uh, is now an assistant professor at Princeton. Um, and uh, in this example, Steve Zhu, who's a high energy physics professor, says the best humans have not yet been produced. The smartest humans, the longest living humans, the more we know about the coding, the more we can optimize it. He's also said that, oh, I'm uh, missing the eye there, but if I give you a diagnostic tool that lets you end up with a kid that has a three times higher chance of getting admitted to MIT, I think people are going to be interested in that. Um, and for those who don't know, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but um, he is affiliated with uh, the company Genomic Prediction, which is attempting to um, offer polygenic selection in, uh, polygenic scores in IVF. Uh, here's another example of the, the other side of the debate, so to speak. This is Dorothy Roberts, professor of sociology at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, she says, research into the genetics of intelligence cannot be socially neutral and indeed will intensify social inequalities, inequities. Uh, she wrote this in a special report that uh, the Hastings Center did on the genetics of intelligence. I think actually Michelle included the opening to that special issue in your, your, your reading, so I highly recommend that you take a look at it. Uh, and uh, she's also said uh, on her Twitter, um, can we focus on ending policing and structural racism, not on polygenic scores to equalize educational attainment? So again, an example of this debate over problem selection. Uh, another example here, this was a piece written last year by Eric Perens, who's at the Hastings Center uh, in Aeon Magazine, it's called The Genes Were Dealt. Uh, and his big point that he wants to drive home here, at least I believe in this piece, is you know, what is said right here in this subheading, the new field of social genomics can be used by progressives to combat racial inequality or by conservatives to excuse it. And so we should be aware of the potential dual uses of this body of work. 
I'm told that Paige responded, uh, or on Monday talked about this piece a little bit to you guys, but Paige Harden responded uh, with her own, own piece in Aeon called The Science of Terrible Men. Um, and it, you know, it's asking this question of given, given this ugly history, given the field was founded by eugenicists, people who held racial ideologies, what do we do? Do we throw up our hands and say this should be a complete no-go area or are there ways that we can use this field of research for good? And I will leave, leave her to explain her position on this. I think she probably did a little bit on Monday. So this is that, that first dilemma, the dilemma of problem selection. Um, if we go to the second dilemma, dilemma re related to publication and data sharing, uh, I think this piece that was in Nature, I think it was, uh, um, it accurately encapsulates what I mean by this, which is that uh, you know, researchers in social science genomics are finding links between people's genes and complex attributes like socioeconomic status or time spent in school but the worry is that their results will be misconstrued. And so that raises questions about um, publication of materials, how data should be shared, what, what the uh, unintended consequences might be of making publicly, data publicly available. Um, one of the big pushes has been in the direct-to-consumer genetic testing market. So now through companies like, this is Gene Plaza here specifically, um, you can send in uh, your genomic data, you know, you go to 23andMe, you get, you get your results, and you can essentially upload your genomic data to a site like Gene Plaza uh, and, and find out, um, get results back for things like math ability. Uh, they very controversially uh, released a test for uh, same-sex sexual behavior after that, that GWAS that came out on that. Um, I think it's colloquially been termed the, the How Gay Are You app. It's since been taken down, but it was available at one point. Uh, and then, of course, there are a host of other uh, genetic testing, direct-to-consumer genetic testing companies where you can get tests to find out, are you faster than a speeding bullet? Do you have the mind of a super genius? Could you be extraordinarily strong without the spinach? So, you know, th there, there are lots of, um, uh, applications out there that consumers can access directly um, and you know as you can see here in this case of math ability it says it's based on the study of James Lee et al um, you know they're, they're illustrating where I don't know if they do it in that that top one but they they talk about what what the study is that they're pulling from in order for them to be able to offer a service such as this uh, we also have uh, romance companies, I don't know what the right word, dating companies, I think is probably <laughs> the right term, um, that it, are, are trying to create, administer perfect matches uh, using genomic data. I was part of a dinner group last night, we were talking about reality television shows, and you might imagine that one day we'll have a reality television show uh, where they try and pair people somehow using genomic data. I think it's, it's possible. Um, and then, of course, there uh, are efforts to try and use polygenic scores in in vitro fertilization, genomic prediction um, that Steve Zhu is affiliated with being one example, but ORCID Health, which people might have heard more recently about being another example. Um, and I will just direct you to this great paper that Patrick, Michelle, Dan, and David um, are authors on around problems with using polygenic scores to select embryos. Uh, and one, one point that I want to highlight in particular, the p potential unintended consequences, that being selecting for adverse traits, altering population demographics, exacerbating inequalities in society, and devaluing certain traits. So um, recommend this paper if you've not yet read it. Okay, so third dilemma. Dilemmas related to engaging society. Uh, and this is where I want to talk a little bit more about genetics and education, the area that first got me interested into these big LC questions. Uh, a couple of people have asked me, you know, how was it that I came to be interested in genetics specifically? And I watched a documentary <laughs> that was uh, called DNA Dreams. It uh, follows the 
build of the cognitive genomics lab at BGI. I highly recommend it if you haven't yet seen it. And for me, it was my first um, introduction to behavioral genetics research. I became fascinated by it. I became fascinated by questions like what are the implications of this for an education system like the U.S. where we stratify along race and class lines. Um, why, why are we thinking, why are researchers conducting this work? What are their motivations for, do it, for doing it? And, you know, again, what are um, potential implications uh, or unintended consequences? So genetics and education is a growing um, uh, area of interest to a number of researchers, of course, not just within social science genomics, but also people who are in the bioethics LC space like me. Um, and, you know, these are just a sample of articles that were written in the Bold blog, um, which I also, again, recommend that you take a look at, that are, are beginning to tackle this, this question of what role and relevance does genetics have for education, what are the implications of it. Um, and I want to preface what comes next by saying that, you know, there are many potential applications of genomic data into education. Um, I became particularly interested in one application, and of course, we'll talk through some of the others, uh, which is this idea of precision education. So in 2013, um, Catherine Asbury, who's at the University of York in the UK, and Robert Plowman, who's at King's College London, published this book called G is for Genes, The Impact of Genetics on Education and Achievement. And they say, personalizing education is the best way to realize the potential of individual children who are naturally different. Um, their conceptualization of precision medicine um, can be thought of as akin to precision medicine uh, in the sense that uh, students would receive an individualized education plan uh, that is informed to an extent by their genomic data. Um, uh, this came out in 2013, and Robert Plowman was asked to give lectures to the Houses of Parliament uh, around this topic of genetics and education. Um, and if we want to take a little bit deeper dive into what exactly they say in this book, um, I'll first just say that you know this book was written with the intention of being read by policymakers and educators. So this is not an academic book that was written for academics. It was a book that was written for policymakers and those in education, educators themselves specifically. So the things they advocate for are things like uh, mandatory subjects should be placed to a minimum. We should restrict to a basic skills examination. And one justification for that that is rooted in the literature is that we are all genetically different. And so a one size fits all approach to education is senseless. Um, you know, I think that many people, you know, in education research where I, I was coming from would not disagree with the fact that a one-size-shoe-fits-all approach to education uh, is not working. Um, and so I think one of the very clever things that they did here was to tap into the existing education literature and write it in a way that was going to be very appealing to, to people who are in education who know of its many challenges and flaws. Another example is um, they say we should increase the range of subject available, uh, subject options available to all students, give teachers more freedom in their lessons, and that gene environment correlation depends on choice is, is one of the reasons why we should do this. Um, I think I forgot to mention that in their book at the conclusion, they provide 11 policy points for what a genetically sensitive school system would look like. So these are the last example, and then this example are um, two of those policy recommendations that they put forth in the book. Again, here, I don't think people would disagree that providing students with more subjects and giving teachers more freedom would be a bad thing in the education system. A third is that preschool children are, are especially susceptible to the effects of shared environment, and so one way to respond to that, to maybe mitigate those effects, especially for children who are at a very young age, is to offer free, high-quality preschool education to disadvantaged children from age two, free high quality preschool to all children from age three to four, and extra support to children in low SES families from birth. Again, I don't think anyone would think that this is not something that we should be doing in our education systems. Um, but this book sparked, of course, a lot of reaction. Uh, a number of 
papers around the idea of a genetically informed education system, what the risks, what the potential benefits of it are, including the second one, which I think was on the reading list um, for you all. Uh, but, you know, as you can see, there are many, uh, there's a growing body of literature interested in this question of the role and relevance of genetics in education, including, uh, you know, I want to draw your attention to this one, which came out uh, earlier this year on the practical utility of genetics screening in school settings, which actually tries to see, you know, is it possible <laughs> to use genomic data in an in, in, in individualized setting within uh, education? The authors there come to the conclusion that for something like precision education, probably not. Uh, but if you want to use it as an additional tool to screen for learning disabilities, uh, there, there is some evidence to suggest that that might be feasible and uh, possible. Yeah. Question: Do the authors give any justification for why genetics specifically is required and thus cannot be replaced with other things such as perhaps screening children at yeah. a young age? Yeah. That's a great question. Skills? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think the the big message that um, I interpreted from the book was that genetics play a role. Uh, they are a confounder, potentially, um, that it, uh, a confounder in um, how we understand different educational interventions to work. And so uh, if we can incorporate genomic data into education, we can identify which interventions students might be, we could better identify, I should say, which intervention students might be most or least receptive to. We can identify if there are areas that they might be, uh, especially the term they, they talk about strengths and weaknesses in the book, that's the language that they use, but identifying students' strengths and identifying their weaknesses and creating supports that allow them to optimize or maximize on those strengths and to mitigate those weaknesses. Does that answer your question? It does. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I was really interested in teacher perceptions of the role and relevance of genetics in education. Why? Uh, well, teachers matter. <laughs> their perceptions of their students impact uh, a child's educational trajectory, the likelihood that they get identified for a program like gifted education, um, how self confident they are in their own capabilities, their um, uh, progression onto higher education. So educators are important stakeholders within the educational enterprise, and I wanted to know what they think, given that there's literature showing that their views of their students have impacts on how those students then do in the classroom. So back to this question. Uh, essentially, what I did was I ran a mixed method study uh, in the United States, even though I was over in the UK at the University of Cambridge, and um, I held focus groups with educators, and I ran a survey, a uh, convenient sample, unrepresentative of the US, the woes of being a PhD student who didn't have unlimited funding, um, but I had 660 respondents to the survey <coughs> from 48 states in Washington, DC. Um, it was pretty representative rate on the, in terms of racial ethnic census categories in comparison to the US, um, but there was an oversampling of female teachers, oversampling of elementary school teachers, so it's not, um, not a representative sample. But uh, what I had teachers do in the survey is I took excerpts from uh, a video that Robert Plowman put out on YouTube, again, a video that was meant to be specifically for educators and policymakers. I uh, took excerpts from that and, and asked teachers to what extent they agreed or disagreed with the statements that he put uh, in that video. Uh, that was one component of the survey that I'm going to focus on today. Um, I think in the paper that was included in the reading list, you can see some of the other, other things that I included in there. Um, and then I held focus groups with teachers at two very different schools. So that school that I talked about at the very start, that was a public charter school that was predominantly African American, predominantly low income, and then uh, also ran focus groups at a private school for gifted students. Um, so all students who were enrolled in that school had to score 140 or above on an IQ test. They had to be assessed by a clinical psychologist. Um, they paid $15,000 a year in tuition. Uh, and it was grades K through eight. So both the um, private school and that charter school are grades K through eight. 
So uh, I asked teachers to what extent they agreed with the statement, not only do children differ in how easily they learn, but it's sort of in what they learn and what they like to learn. And 48% um, of teachers agreed with that statement. Uh, I also asked teachers to e explain the extent to which they agreed with children differ, and they differ genetically. Again, these are direct quotes from Robert Plowman. 47% agreed with that statement as well. Uh, and then I also asked teachers about don't just automatically blame teachers in schools and parents realize that genetics is important. Uh, and they're just under 40% of survey respondents said that they agreed. And this is agree. Um, you know, if, if I were to group the uh, agree with strongly agree, we'd be up over 50% for, for all of these. Uh, and then I also asked um, a, 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 the statement, a student's genetics play an important role in their success in the classroom. And I wanted to know, how, how much do you agree with this? This was not from Robert Plowman. This was, this was something that, that I developed and piloted. Um, and 39% said that they somewhat agree with that, and 20% said that they agreed with that statement that a child's genetics play, or student's genetics play an important role in their success in the classroom. So, of course, uh, you know, I was intrigued by this, and in the focus groups, I had the opportunity to dive into these points in more detail. Um, I also had open text responses in the survey where people were able to elaborate. So, what I'm going to do next is to show those uh, free text responses from the survey and also quotes from the focus groups in terms of uh, people's perspectives, again, on the role and relevance of genetics for education. Um, so let's start with things that people, responses people had that were more optimistic that felt that there was a role in relevance. Um, here's one, this was from the survey. They say, I know genetics is hugely controversial because in a democratic society we believe we can influence outcomes. Honestly, I always wanted to believe this, but I've seen families where with modest interventions their children have been exceptionally successful and others where their children have to work extremely hard to keep up. So this respondent is, is acknowledging that they think genetics play a role. Here's another example from the focus group. Um, this this uh, participant's referring to Carol Dweck, the person who um, people might know of in relation to the growth mindset. And uh, she says, Dweck would be like, the sky's the limit. That's a bull-faced lie, isn't it? Because of different things, social constructs, the way systematic things. And then I really, and I know it might be totally taboo to say, but I do believe everybody's given a different measure of whatever that is. One last example, also from the focus group. They say, you hear IQ is the determiner of the possible success or advancements. Look, are some babies born more intelligent in terms of that sort of horsepower? I think so. I do think that genes have a part, and I do think environment has a part to do with it, and it's sort of setting the standard. I think some people are ahead in the game, some people have those great, great genes. So these are responses that were um, more favorable towards the role of genetics. Uh, let's look at some that were less favorable. Um, this is from the survey. They say, in an impressive society such as ours, using genetics as a reason for classifying people can be very dangerous if people do not understand the limitations of such an approach. Another example, this is from the focus group. We, that being society, make a mistake to focus on genetic background and race because these are factors we have no control over and this can allow people to relinquish responsibility for any gaps in test scores or whatever measure of achievement is used. And I wish, I wish Paige was here um, because I know uh, a lot of her conversation around how genetics can be used for good is that uh, we actually have the responsibility to do something instead of relinquishing it. One more example, also from the survey. They say, I just don't think genetics is the best way to address the issues going on in schools. This sounds like Divergent or some other creepy utopian novel. Uh, there is actually a, a common theme of dystopia, utopia, in terms of people referring to science fiction, Gattaca, also. Um, I agree with the idea that teachers need to have freedom and be engaged in their subjects with less standardization. Students need choice and voice and teachers need to meet students' individual needs. I just don't think the connection to genetics is important for this. And then, of course, there are people who had more nuanced perspectives, um, such as this person. I support the idea of teachers understanding a child's challenges, but don't want to label someone as being limited. 
there is always a chance a student can do better than what was predicted. So this is dangerous territory if we link everything to genetics. Or conversely, open everything up to everyone and drop standards and expect all educators and students to rise to the occasion. So saying that there's some relevance, we've got to be very cautious about how we do it. Um, and uh, it might be bad also if we don't, if we don't um, consider this and just leave everything up and expect that everyone's going to, to rise to the occasion. Uh, one more example here. So reducing students to genetic profiles only captures a part of who they are as human beings. I agree genetics are an important component in understanding how students learn, but it is certainly not the only thing. So again, a more nuanced perspective. What does this mean for educational equity? What do you guys think? And by this, I mean you know, the whole <coughs> integration of molecular genetic data into education. I'll narrow the scope. Let's start with what are some potential positives about the implications of genetics for educational equity? One of the things that people like to talk about, I don't know if it's been realized at all, but if someone has like a risk score that's high for something, uh, like dyslexia, they could identify that early in life and then help them through a critical period that can really boost their scores. Yeah. Other thoughts? One thing I always think about is like uh, they, especially in the case of big women, they historically marginalized. And so, um, you know, like for instance, if they never went to college, or like you know, like about a hundred years ago, or you know, few went to college. Of course, they didn't always do as well. And something like this can actually show that indeed, you know, like genetics, genetically their makeup is quite similar. I know that biological arguments of other brain circumference and of brain mass were used to also keep women out. But I, I can imagine like not women to place any group that's um, you know, on the margins mm -hmm. uh, using something like that, given that on the phenotype they have just never had an opportunity mm -hmm. to demonstrate. So potentially disrupting the dominant narrative about yeah. groups of people. Yeah. In theory, offering additional um, support for students who may on the lower end of the spectrum of certain weaknesses. Mm -hmm. I saw your hand up. Oh, I was just scratching my head. Oh. <laughs> Anything else? The, the sheer realization of, like, of, of the foundation of like, how genetics contributes to heterogeneous effects in response to intervention mm -hmm. by program managers with, with help. Mm -hmm. policy implications. Any other thoughts? I guess I'm actually kind of surprised by how few obvious positives there are. Mm. I mean, I would think that they're, you know, that since this is such an interesting tool that you could potentially use, aside from like personalized interventions or, yeah, there doesn't seem to be so much of a, a benefit. I feel like there could be really interesting findings that like given the genetics or given the collagen for some sort of learning outcome, we could probably uncover mm -hmm. like where the policies fall sh short or mm -hmm. where like racial discrimination comes in and you know like other environmental factors on top of you know like above and beyond the genetic factors. Yeah. Yeah. So related to that the heterogeneous effects. Yeah. I wonder, do any of the instructors have thoughts on this question? Michelle? Thank you for giving me permission to speak, because otherwise I would not have felt like doing that. Um, so I'll, I'll just share from, I work at a health system, and there's a large clinical and research uh, group that I'm not really part of, but I'm sort of adjacent to it, so I'm aware of it, that focuses on developmental delays and disabilities with a genetics lens. And since it's not polygenic scores, um, they're getting into using that. It's primarily rare variants, so it's not exactly the same thing. But their experience, the genetic counselors and the clinicians who work with, it's often familial, 
right? So they maybe the index patient is a kid, but then they, they usually genotype mom, dad, etc. And when they find a deletion, what often happens is you have a history of in, in these families of a lot of uh, phenotypes, if you will, that are already stigmatized. So they, these are people who've had problems with relationships, they've had problems keeping jobs, they've had problems in school, they've had problems throughout their lives, and generally they've been told it's their fault or it's their parents' fault, right? Like your, your parents didn't raise you right, or you're lazy, or you've done something wrong. And so this is obviously one perspective from, and I want to be clear, from a group that is passionate about this work, but their experience with working with these patients is that it is typically very beneficial for those people to hear that there is an explanation. So, you know, medicalizing things, geneticizing, if that's a word, things, I think always has a double-edged sword. I think Daphne will lead us to uh, consideration of the other half of that in a second. But on the positive end, I think it can, you know, offer an explanation for what people have experienced and can unify a lot of experiences and also alleviate um, a lot of self-blame that's really, honestly, you know, damaging. David, I think your hand was raised for a second. Sure. Yeah, yeah I, was, I, was say, I was struck by how many of these quotes seem to illustrate the fallacy that people think of genes, genes are fixed, therefore their effects must be fixed. And it's a huge pedagogical challenge just conveying the idea that, that um, even though your genes might be fixed as con conception, the effects that they're going to have on various outcomes are going to depend on, on choices we make, the policy environment we choose to set for ourselves and these sorts of things. Um, well, that's why Michelle's talk on responsible communication tomorrow night is going to be extra <laughs> great. I was thinking about, like, um, like, I get the positive things that can come out of it. And I'm just curious on what you think could be, like, factors that could help manage the delivery of um, trying to manage um, uh, or delivery of trying to have polygenic scores for all students across schools. In a sense, uh, you know, even though it is really cheap to genotype, for us researchers, it may not be cheap for like public schools to do like individual students. So I wanted to a degree more private, more schools and more predominantly white and socioeconomically affluent neighborhoods could afford those resources to have that individualized education, personalized education, but meanwhile all of the schools that cannot afford the genotype get less money. Right. Yeah, I the um Oh, yes. So, oh, goodness. Sorry. I completely <laughs> dropped the ball on repeating the questions or and people's responses. So the question was, um, given the possibility that this notion of precision education will be most actionable by um, schools that have greater number of resources, maybe they're private schools or they're in more affluent areas, what can we do to, to mitigate that happening, right? Okay, great. That's the million dollar question. <laughs> I, I don't think that um, I have a panacea for, for that issue. And so I think that that um, is one of the big concerns that, that I have. And you know, uh, I'm jumping the gun in terms of asking people about what they think are potential negatives um, to this. But you know, I don't think that there's necessarily an easy answer. Um, I think there are methodological things like increasing the diversity of the samples that researchers have access to so that um, if there are benefits afforded by polygenic scores for education related behaviors and outcomes that they're actionable for students of all ancestries um, but you know our American in order to answer that question properly I'd have to be able to tell you how to fix the US education system and even though I have a PhD in education I really don't know how to do that <laughs> Yeah. It's, I mean, at least my 
that seems like a really hard. Yeah, it, it, yeah. I j it seems like a really hard problem, and I don't know when we will ever get there. Yeah. So that's <laughs> essentially the concern that this paper had: the practical utility of genetic screening in in school settings. They're saying, you know, there's this growing conversation on precision education, but let's let's hold our horses and see if this is actually feasible. Can this actually be done before we jump forward and, and make recommendations that we should be doing this? Yeah, I like that point very much. And two issues, really. The first is <laughs> how, in, how predictive are these scores? And the answer, once you condition on all the other things that they will re educators will observe, and the answer is not very. But suppose that changes one day. Even then, it's not clear what we do with it. You know, it, it it's... Um, um, if you have some intervention, you find that it works better in girls than boys. You know, maybe we should. Okay, maybe now we've learned that teaching chemistry this way has a bigger treatment effect on girls, and maybe then you can make an argument that there's some cost benefit that it passes. But there's that's kind of separate issue from whether you know the fraction of variance in chemistry uh, test scores explained that's explained by whether you're a boy mm -hmm. or a girl. There's no obvious relationship between these two things, and often in this conversation. People hear, oh, the polygenic scores are very, have a lot of predictive power, and therefore we should start uh, intervening based on people's polygenic scores. And there's, there's a huge jump there uh, that I think Grant is alluding to. I think someone over here. Yes, Dave. Yeah, I was going to make two related points. One is the current polygenic scores are not really the right instrument for thinking about these questions, because what you really want to know is. Um, you want a polygenic score for reaction to an intervention. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, that would tell you about the, you know, how to genetically you know, use genetic data to, to target the intervention. The other point is also related to something David said, um, which is that you, I, I think as a practical matter, um, it's pretty much, I mean, it's hard to imagine it ever not being the case. It is the case now, and I think will always be the case, that Previous school performance is a better predictor of, of subsequent school performance than a polygenic score. Um, and conditional on previous school performance, I think a polygenic score will always have negligible predictive power no matter how good it gets. So I think the, the, the practical question that this conversation should be focused on is the use of polygenic scores at preschool like when you're entering school and you don't yet have other good data, um, and th that seems to not quite be where the conversation is right now. Mm -hmm. By conversation, you mean this idea of precision education as Asbury and Plowman articulate it? Yeah, I mean, and maybe I'm just misreading your slides, but it seemed to me like the, like the quotes you gave and the, the, my understanding of their book was, was not focused just on that. that yeah. It was about the whole schooling experience. But it seems to me like that really is the, the potential time period where intervention would, could make sense. Yeah. I mean, you're right that they're, they're thinking of a genetically sensitive education system rather than a specific component within the education system. Um, you know, I, I would be curious to hear what their thoughts are on you know, I, yeah, I don't know at what stage would they implement it just with kids who are coming into preschool. Is it something that they would try and retroactively to apply to a student um, population? So that's a good point. Tammy? I was just curious, kind of in relation to all of this, have there been any RCTs that have controlled for genetic background for certain educational interventions? So Patrick, I, I think Patrick has written one of, one of two papers that have What's the question exactly? <laughs> Whether there have been any RCTs that have controlled for genetic background? Yeah, I mean, like, so, so there's there's the compulsory schooling papers where you know you, you look at um, you know the uh, effect of education in like high and low um, polygenic score groups um, using compulsory schooling laws, so you can get sort of the causal effect. Um, I mean, I mean, so that's a, that's a quasi experiment. That's not an RCT. Um, and it's also, um, I mean, it, it is a bit funny to think about how that would then apply to some of these precision education types of questions. I, I don't, I don't think you learn anything about like, you know, how you should intervene on, on children to make them benefit in some way um, from that. You, you, you just learn that you know people 
the, the um, you know, the effect of schooling is different on different kids. And um, yeah, so it's not it's not clear what what the, what the intervention is that's implied by that. I mean, in some sense, people have been doing what you're suggesting for a long time, but they've been doing it with monozygotic twins, where you know, assign one to the control group and the other to the treatment group, and, and that kind of re reduces residual variance, and for the same reason that a polygenic score could potentially. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting that that research design has been around for a while, but there you used, um, you know, you matched, you matched based on uh, the, the zygosity of twins and, and, so, and so indirectly controlled for the polygenic scores plus other things that the twins shared. But I think the issue is that th there are settings where this would clearly pass the cost-benefit test, but it's just taking a while for the, for the data to catch up. You know. um, I know that there's some RCTs underway where people are collecting <coughs> genetic data. Okay, yeah. any other thoughts on this point? Yeah. I was just thinking about like how like uh, a polygenic score by itself would uh, say something about like uh, like how a student would perform. Like, I mean, how that interacts with like like how the child is raised, the environment or parents would dictate like how that would manifest it. So I guess like personalizing like education <coughs> would would really be difficult because that it would be on the premises that okay the PGS of this score would definitely translate to, to the child. Mm -hmm. Which is not the case. Uh, but on that point I wanted the I think it's been highlighted that okay, like in terms of estimating the impact of intervention. So if uh, genetic predisposition is a, is a confounder, like estimating the impact of a program or an intervention more precisely would be a really huge contribution, I guess, for in terms of practicality. I mean, I, I, I think that a lot of the, the big value of you know, social science genomics research that we do is is just to improve research. You know, and so you know when we think about what, what's the value in terms of like a precision education, like maybe I don't think we have the real information. It's not really the target of a lot of what what we're doing. But I think we wanted to talk about what's the value of what we're doing to improve just the research endeavor. I think there's lots, like well, you know, the kinds of things that you're saying and, and the research that many of us do. Um, just a different question. Yeah, I just. I have regard, I just want to raise something that someone posted in the Zoom. Um, I can said if, if education linked to genes and at the same time to positive life, the life outcomes of the system that supports inequality. Could you say that again? I didn't quite get it. If education, if education is linked to genes and at the same time to positive life outcomes, this is a system that supports inequality. What do people think about that? Given that, like kids in different strata have a much more equal ability than we think they have, they do. I think there's maybe also an added complexity that just the the goals or benefits of ed education aren't necessarily a single unitary construct to aim for equity on mm -hmm. or look at the impact of intervention on. So depending on whether in the scope of education you're looking to like create a well-rounded individual who has some form of education, maybe in the mm -hmm. sense of like, here's a collection of fields and pick whatever you want, versus say, impact 
SDS that exist in a current cultural context or impacts on health that exist in a cultural context where maybe currently education links to those things, but intervening at education is only a proxy for whatever the end goal would be and maybe it's the wrong route to intervene on. Mm -hmm. this. Um, that's like my sense from uh, educators in my family and other places is that there's not even agreement on how to measure what is success mm -hmm. in the educational mm -hmm. context is to Yeah, that's a good point, and I'll, I'll just say that in talking with teachers in focus groups, they, um, especially in the public charter school, um, they would talk about how, you know, we have this view in our society that going into college, that that is the definition of educational success, and that's not the definition that I hold for what success should be like in education. So, absolutely, yeah. So, I think I, this would require a big reimagining of the society, as would a lot of these proposals. But I think I disagree with the assertion that we should be distributing resources equally. And I think that a polygenic index, even if it doesn't necessarily get at like how reactive someone would be to intervention, could be useful in young kids for predicting phenotypes that might not emerge until later. Mm -hmm. So perhaps they have some sort of propensity to have a, a issues later on in life, but they're three years old, so you don't have you know knowledge of that yet. And so that, alongside other indicators of um, you know, future like outcomes could be used in some sort of way to then redistribute scarce educational resources in a way that privileges those who are currently more at risk. Mm -hmm. And so I think there it's less about being, you know, responsive to intervention and the polygenic score and precision stuff, but more using a polygenic index as an indicator of what might happen in the future so that we can maybe correct course now. So re, kind of like resource alloc yeah. using it to help inform resource allocation. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I was thinking like could you consider the case of like a child being like having like the best teacher that was in genetic school, right? And like performing really bad, and then like like it's become like a like a way to flag being like oh what is this thing? Mm. This kind of key thing. So if there is not concordance between what or like a big dissimilarity because mm -hmm. I mean the word. Like we have trouble explaining the predictive power of PGIs and the role of genetics to adults that are educated in this space. I wonder what potential consequences it can have on a child knowing that they're undergoing education that has been customized according to their genetic profile. And especially, um, and, and another separate thing is also maybe related to what David was, was saying, like these polygenic indices are predictive in the current time in a specific population. There is nothing at least in my opinion, like we don't know if, you know, if we start customizing education in order to improve these kids' outcomes in 20 years from now, mm -hmm. that polygenic index might look entirely different because the, the sort of kind of the environmental channels that genetics would take to influence outcomes might be completely different. Mm -hmm. So I guess, how do we justify that even scientifically? Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? I just want to add one, one more thing. If I if I remember the Plum quote you gave where you justified early intervention correctly, the argument was you have some evidence from behavior genetics that the variance components are like this, therefore we should intervene earlier. And I agree with you, a lot of his conclusions oh, are perfectly non controversial. Yeah. But 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 like no, no think about the Goldberg critique. Whenever you see these sorts of um, claims, it's it, it's uh, you know the family environment explains X percent of variance, and therefore, so we jump from something that's an R square, and we go to saying that we can t infer something about the effectiveness of some intervention. And that, I, I just don't think that's, that, I just think that's a log logical non sequitur. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Gotta go through a lot of things. Okay, so some of the things that came up when we were thinking about potential positives were that learning disabilities could be an active area of research. We might um, be able to help students who uh, may have a predisposition to di dyslexia, who are current under our current education system, we do a bad job of diagnosing them early. Um, student or children could receive extra help sooner. Um, students who are mix misdiagnosed could be placed in the appropriate environment. Uh, it could be uh, useful in helping us understand how our education system currently 
under or over diagnosis students. Um, and then we started talking about some of the potential risks. I wanted to see if people had thoughts to add on to that and to what's already been discussed. I think this has been a motivation for, for a lot of people's interest in, in personalized education that I, I would assume or would hope would be to reduce inequality, but I think in practical terms it would, it would probably make it worse. Other thoughts? I think even if that's not true, even if we reach a point where we have perfect representation across ancestries, I think it would deepen inequities within ancestries, which is just as problematic um, when you start stratifying children early on. I think that were you to do something like that, you'd also need to be very careful about the message that you're giving children, just because, like we saw about their teacher's expectation of success, and you have to shield them from a lot of this information that could potentially be useful, because if a teacher expects that a student is genetically predispositioned to do worse in class, it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy that can have even worse sort of serious mm -hmm. impacts than what you would experience otherwise. I just think there's a lot of potential for unintended consequences there. Yeah. Okay, so differential access to screening, maybe due to the limited portability of findings and are skewed towards samples uh, with European genetic ancestries. The commercialization of genetics as, as another um, potential area where, again, as Juan pointed out, parents with the resources and means might be ones to try and go um, utilize these services and then, you know, which schools are they going to go to to advocate for their child to receive that extra help sooner. Um, one thing that didn't come up was, well, kind of came up, was discrimination based on genotype. Um, so, of course, GINA protects against discrimination in some settings, but it does not protect, protect against genetic discrimination in schools. Um, and then there's also the potentially negative psychosocial impacts of receiving, say, a low polygenic score for educational attainment. Um, this was a study published this year by Lucas Matthews et al. Um, he's at Columbia uh, University, and um, I'll just say that we're, we're doing a follow-up study together on this lower point about the psychosocial impacts of receiving a low polygenic score for educational mm -hmm. attainment. Um, so this raises a bunch of questions, some of which we've already raised here together. Uh, one being which schools or parents will be able to realize the benefits, if any, of integrating genomics into education. So will it be private schools? Will it be wealthier parents? Um, will integrating genetics into education place medical responsibilities on those who are not medically trained? So are teachers going to be um, in some way responsible for uh, diagnosis of learning disabilities with information that they're actually not trained to know how to utilize? Um, can schools deny students at risk for a host of costly developmental disorders if they uh, have a predisposition according to their polygenic index for things like dyslexia or ADHD? Um, and will this reinforce, could this reinforce society's tendency to conflate race with academic achievement or, you know, other elements um, of educational success? Yeah, that's a good point. Is, is that the case also for the lack of portability of scores across ancestries? I mean, actually, I think the concern, the concern in the case of cognitive testing is, is, um, is more than we might be biased against um, the, the non-majority group because okay. they're constructed in such a way so that it's a slightly different issue. And I'll just add on to that that there is um, – 
you know, gifted education is one area in the U.S. that has been identified as particularly problematic in terms of its identification of students for its services. And so, um, you know, people are developing uh, what they're what they consider to be more culturally sensitive cognitive performance tests. I'm, you know, I'm sure that people will have to weigh in on, on what they think of those, but um, just want to highlight that point. Okay, so um, I would love to refresh on the three dilemmas of social responsibility that I talked through at the start. Does anyone remember one or all three of them? Problem selection. Problem selection, that's one. Publication. Publication and data sharing, that's two. What was the last one? Close enough, yeah. Engaging society, yeah. yeah, yeah. So here we are. Okay, revisiting these, and I just want to talk a little bit more about this last one, um, dilemmas related to engaging society, and in particular, engaging the community. Um, and so here I'm going to talk about the work that Michelle and Patrick and Dan and Paige and Dalton, and I hope I'm not missing anyone <laughs> from the instructor list, um, are, are part of, which is a working group titled Wrestling with Social and Behavioral Genomics, Risks, Potential Benefits, and Ethical Responsibility. Um, it's a three-year grant-funded working group with bioethicists, genomicists, psychologists, economists, you know, I, I'll go on, but it's an interdisciplinary group of people. Um, and we absolutely disagree about the risks and potential benefits of social and behavioral genomics. But we have two primary aims, uh, one of which is considering whether it's possible to answer the question, are there ethically acceptable or unacceptable areas of research? And then two, thinking about responsible conduct and communication of social and behavioral genomics research. Um, and the part that I focus most on in this working group is the formation of a sounding board, um, sort of similar to a community advisory board, um, but part of the realization our working group had and our granting, our grantors, grant, granting bodies had was that we are a group of academics. We are pretty homogenous in many respects, even though we're coming from these interdisciplinary backgrounds. And um, we might have, have blind spots or things that we're not noticing because we're you know, uh, fairly similar in terms of being academic researchers. Uh, and so we should incorporate perspectives of, of people who maybe don't know anything about social and behavioral genomics. Um, and so we created a 13-member a group of non-academics, non-experts in genomics who are coming from across the U.S. Um, you know, we span the West Coast, East Coast, Mountain Time, and Central Time. It's been very <laughs> difficult to organize <laughs> meeting times that work for all of those different uh, schedules, and the East Coast people have been very generous with giving up their evenings for our meetings. Um, but uh, we in include people such as, you know, assistant superintendent, undergrads, law student, community health worker, rancher, farm technician, cart pusher, housewife, mental health therapist, the head of a nonprofit, Spanish teacher, retired police officer. So again, people who are um, doing very different uh, daily work, daily professions. Um, we also tried to, and I'll, I'll add that this was difficult to do, <laughs> we tried to um, get different political orientations as part of the group. It was immensely difficult to get conservative participants, um, and this is, you know, an area that I think we're going to have to continue to think hard about how we can do better. Yeah. Do you, do you have a guess as to why that's the case? Gosh, I, I, would, I wonder if Michelle has a, has a theory. Uh, I don't know if I have a good sense for why. I will say, you know, it's not like we didn't get anyone applying who identified as conservative or moderate. But for some reason, when I would follow up to interview is not the right term, but we had 15-minute conversations with everyone just to make sure that they were reasonable people, I didn't get follow-up more often for some reason from the conservative respondents. I don't know why that is. Michelle, do you have any theories? I mean, I could tell lots of stories <laughs> to explain that, but I, I don't have any evidence to back it, so why don't you just <laughs> Yeah, it was difficult. That's <laughs> the key message is that it was, it was hard to do. Um, and we also have a spread of religions. We have people who identify as atheists, Muslim, Baptist, Mormon, Catholic, Pentecostal, Protestant, agnostic. I have atheists <laughs> twice in there. <laughs> and um, we 
meet for 90 minutes. Uh, we've had two meetings so far. We have a third meeting coming up end of September. Um, and we kicked off our first meeting by asking people, you know, when you hear genetics, what comes to mind? Uh, if you've heard of the term at all before, and you know, people said a lot of things are related to ancestry, family, relatives. Um, someone said, what connects me to my parents and me to my girls? Uh, we had one person who said everything that's alive has DNA, and in the indigenous perspective, we believe that all things are related to each other. So that's what I think of when I think of genetics. I think of DNA, and here's what DNA makes me think of. Um, people who thought of epigenetics, someone saw potential. Um, so, you know, people, people know the word, had heard of the word genetics. They didn't necessarily know about social and behavioral genomics, but when they um, hear the word genetics, this is, these are some of the things that uh, come to mind for them. And the kinds of things we hope to talk to them about include questions like, what makes you excited about this area of research? What makes you nervous? Are there topics of study that make you more or less uncomfortable? And if so, what are they? Are we leaving out something important when we list reasons why we might do or should not do research in this area? Um, and can you help us see how our strategies for communicating with the public about this research could be improved? Um, so I'm, I'm almost done here, um, but I want to send this take-home message that genes don't operate in a vacuum. Our research shouldn't operate in a vacuum either. I believe that science deals with values. It answers the questions that we ask it. Um, and we should recognize the importance of moving beyond simply conducting genomic analyses and prioritize proactive communication and outreach. Um, and I also know it's really difficult to do. <laughs> uh, and Resnick and Elliot know this too, and they say recognizing one's social responsibilities as a scientist is an important step towards exercising social responsibility, but it's just the beginning. Um, and so I want to end by just providing a couple of examples of efforts that I've found particularly interesting um, that I think get at this point of trying to exercise social responsibility. So the first is this NSF grant um, that just got funded uh, about redefining the high school genetics education curriculum. Um, they're calling it a, a genetics education curriculum called human, Humane Genome Literacy in order to re le reduce the belief in genetic essentialism. And so they're educating um, high school biology teachers, who are the people who most often teach genetics in high school. Uh, and you know, we were talking with Andrea when she gave one of her first bio lectures about Mendelian genetics and how that's what we often learn in high school a biology class and how that can be very misleading. Um, can anyone define genetic essentialism for me? I'll go with Tammy. <laughs> I wanted to see if anyone else was going to raise their hand. Go for it. It's in some ways the belief that your inner DNA gives the essence to your being. Yeah, so it's this idea that people don't process information about genetic attributions in a rational or even-handed way. I think that was maybe what Dan was alluding to when he was saying maybe genetics is special in some way. Um, and people think of genetic attributions as, you know, as David pointed out, being, you know, fixed uh, in some way and of a specific etiology, dividing people into homogenous or discrete groups. So um, there is this belief that we have a tendency to think of genes in essentialist ways. Um, I just want to add one caveat is not the right word, but layer of the onion to this, which is this idea of strategic essentialism which is, it, it's not that we are all practicing genetic essentialism in a uniform way, but actually we're practicing it strategically and that people draw on multiple categories, causal factors, their pre-existing belief systems and values um, to, to incorporate genetic information in a way that might be resonant with, with what it is that they already believe. Uh, two examples of this, uh, one is this paper that was published by Aaron Panofsky on white nationalists and genetic ancestry testing. Really fascinating paper if you haven't read it, um, but you know, it's an interesting case of uh, when genetic ancestry testing results are dis 
are, are not in alignment with uh, members of, of white nationalist groups, how they're able to write the narrative to make it make sense to them. Uh, another example being Alondra Nelson, who's the deputy director of science and society, I think, in the, in the Biden administration. Her book, The Social Life of DNA, which looks at how African Americans, um, especially those who are descendants of slaves, try and use genetic ancestry testing to figure out where, where their origins are and, um, again, how many of them use genealogical records to try and find where, where their, their family relatives came from uh, and when genetic testing supports or, again, does not support what they found through genealogical mapping, um, you know, how they make it make sense. Um, so all of that is just to say that, that this NSF grant um, uh, is around trying to reduce racially belief, biased beliefs by fostering a complex understanding of human genetics research in high school biology students, and they've just started with their training of the teachers. Uh, another example is PG Ed. This is a nonprofit organization based out of the Boston area. Um, I'm a huge fan of the work that they do. They are, um, you know, they will hold public town halls where they try and make genetic information or uh, provide context on uh, genetics and society to, uh, you know, members of the public. They have lesson plans that are free to download for teachers who um, are trying to teach about, you know, different aspects of genetics. So they have a lesson plan on direct-to-consumer testing, one on genetics and the environment, athletics and genetics, history, eugenics and um, genetics. So they have a range of, of different lesson plans. Uh, and then the last thing that I'll mention, which is not necessarily specific within genetics genomics, but, you know, a number of research institutions have research ethics consult services. Stanford is one of them. Um, and so I would just encourage people to look and see if their institutions have research ethics consult services. We take consults for a host of human subjects research projects. Um, but, you know, we've, we've had consults from people who are conducting polygenic analyses um, and are seeing their, their findings potentially, see the prospect of their findings being used in uh, embryo selection and so meet with us to try and think through how can they how can they try and, and um, safeguard against this, or what are some of the big concerns about that, poten about that potentially occurring? So I'm um, just going to put in a plug for research ethics consult services. Uh, and then the final message that I think has come to inform my general take uh, on genetics and social sciences is that researchers find themselves in disparate groups. But the questions, the ideas, the controversies that surround a field like social science genomics are just too big um, to remain siloed, and yet they still do. Um, so I think that that's all. Do people have questions? Yeah. Um, so I guess in regards to um, uh, the focus group paper and the individual interviews, um, one thing I strike about having focus groups is that relative to individual interviews is that you can see kind of consensus and also points of contention between participants mm -hmm. in focus groups. So I was curious as when you did the focus groups, was there any point that like you found like they really disagreed on some topic? Yeah. Um, the most interesting one, and I didn't include it here, but was about how Oh, sorry. The question was, were there any points of contention or disagreements that emerged from the focus groups? Um, the most interesting one and surprising to me, especially in the public charter school context, was how much people thought race mattered. And I had to think a lot how much race mattered in terms of students' educational trajectories. And um, I had gone in with thinking that, you know, teachers who are working in a school that is predominantly ethnic minority are going to think that it plays a role because they're seeing educational inequities happening in front of their eyes. Um, and there was disagreement among people uh, about the extent to which they thought race played a role. Um, and I think the tension that particularly was some people felt that socioeconomic status is, is what matters more. And, and when people think about race, actually it's socioeconomic status and not race. Uh, but so that was, that was an interesting disagreement that I definitely didn't anticipate in that particular focus group context emerging. <laughs> 
for having me. I really enjoyed it.